Welcome back to the Fantasy Network, everyone. We are back with the usual suspects to talk about, uh, in my opinion, one of the elite authors in science fiction and fantasy, and that is R. Scott Baker. We're talking about The White Luck Warrior today, which is book two in The Aspect Emperor. We are going to be diving into full spoilers just in case you're just tuning in to see what the live stream is about. You don't want to get spoiled, though. Most of this is so dense and confusing, it probably wouldn't spoil anything for you anyways. Uh, I am joined by my two favorite guests to discuss this with, and that is, of course, Shelf Unstable Amanda. Amanda, how you doing? Doing pretty well. Uh, excited to talk about the shit between us. Yes, there's, there's <laughs> a lot to talk about here. And uh, we're also joined by Slowly Red, which of course is Mark, who is, uh, you know, a beacon in the online community for uh, Baker content and definitely my guiding light through the series that has confused me and made me feel awkward at many, many points. Mark, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, brother. I am doing great. And you are not alone. We have all we have all been confused while walking the dark <laughs> path of, the, of this series. It's the slog of slogs. You know, slog is so uh, intertwined with Wheel of Time at this point, you know, when I talk about fantasy books. But for me, it has a whole new context, and it's actually endearing. Uh, when I say it's a slog of slogs, I mean it's time to fucking turn up. You know what I mean? It's time to go. Uh, it's going to be a real chopper. And uh, do you shit when you shit? That's the real question <laughs> yeah. coming out of the white. <laughs> Uh, I am excited to be demonetized on this video. Uh, <laughs> well, Mark, uh, this is your reread. So how do you feel coming in from this on a second time? Uh, kind of similar to how I, my feelings about the judging eye. I really got to enjoy a lot of the details. I really got to soak up things that were kind of glossed over that first read. You know, when you're first reading it, you're playing so much detective. You hmm. know, you're really trying to find out, figure out all this mysterious shit that's going on. Um, some things that are straightforward or also they, they maybe they're not so straightforward. So you start to question everything. So the second time through, I don't have all those questions. You know what I mean? Or if yeah. I still have lingering questions, they're not as many. So I have a lot more time to focus on all this other stuff that ba Baker has done. And damn, it's just awesome because there's certain things, like I said, that I glossed over that now reading them the second time, I'm like, this is heavy and awesome. And it really adds to the epicness of this, this tale, you know, yeah. and uh, I'm sure we'll get into all that. But yeah, I had, I had a blast and I was still pleasantly surprised that the book uh, could make me jump out of my seat still. Yeah. You know, even knowing what's going to happen. I mean, that is the sign of, of what I would consider to be a great novel or a great series or whatever it might be. And and it's weird because usually uh, the experienced readers are jealous of a first time reader. They're saying, man, if I could read that for the first time, I'm finding myself envious that you've read it twice because you are getting to attach to way different types of context. Now, that, like like you said, you're not playing detective anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really nice. It's nice to be back in the world just for, you know, just because I love it. But then also it's like I, I'm getting a lot out of that set that reread yeah certainly and amanda you are a first-time reader just like me as i'm sure everyone knows by now uh how did you find this follow-up to the judging eye which i know you absolutely loved uh yeah it, just, baker train don't stop for amanda uh <laughs> absolutely loved it yeah um i i will say i think uh judging eye is still my favorite out of all of them that i've read okay. so far uh but yeah i mean white luck warrior was like such an easy five stars that it's like who cares <laughs> it's, yeah it's uh, getting harder to read other shit <laughs> yeah, it, uh I, I read a couple of other things uh in between and it just doesn't well for one thing everything else i'm reading i feel like i'm reading it so fast because I'm, I'm not having to yeah like uh, i think I, I mentioned to you um like these books are going to take me forever to get through when every other line i just have to like stare at the ceiling <laughs> just from like the just how how heavy some of some of the stuff can feel and just how good some of the prose hits like it, it takes forever but it's like in such a good way because I'm, I'm have to sit with it and really like just luxuriate in it marinate in despair right uh, <laughs> marinate kinda, in despair. <laughs> kind of how i feel uh, my experience has been with this and and so many quotable moments and coming into the white lock warrior one of the things that i loved about the judging eye is that finale and yes. i felt like Maybe for the slog of slogs, we're going to get some sort of like relief. And it turns out absolutely not. We're still going to the coffers. No weepers on the slog. But now we have drugs. 
now we have Kiri, which is <laughs> what we end up finding out, you know, is basically dead man's ashes, you know, non men. And I was <laughs> the, the whole time I was like, this is probably going to be pretty like a this is going to be messed up by the end of it. Right. <laughs> and then, of course, it was cleric being uh, driveled down into Kiri and then they continue their drug dependency. It's just like <laughs> the cycle that never ends. It's, it's almost just... like we got addicted to Kiri with them because when cleric wow. dies at the end, I'm like, oh, sweet. Well, now you can burn his body and get more Kiri. <laughs> see i'm still a sweet summer child and i was like you know what i was like maybe maybe they'll they'll see that this is not the way now they snort they just <laughs> no. get a line of of cleric yeah. and, and kept moving. Like, no, we're, of cleric. we're getting that here <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's like the um, most messed up communion because it's like the body of a god right yeah kind i mean of. And how do you top like judging eye, the heart and the chest coming out of these pits, you know, and then you top it the, the way you top it is that you have a dragon that came on an alien arc and you're sniffing your dead friend's remains who cannot <laughs> keep his memory. I mean, it's just like this is the most bonkers stuff I've ever read, guys. Like, I don't know. I don't even know how to formulate thoughts around some of these events. <laughs> It's uh, massively epic. It's massively epic. It is. It is in a different way, too. You know what I mean? Like, we all know epic. You know, guy goes up and has a big sword. It's time. And it's like, oh, we've been waiting for this big matchup. But like with Cleric and Akami, and there's this dread of like, they're going to end up fighting. They're going to end up fighting. And Akami does everything he possibly can to get Cleric to remember. And he's going back with his uh, Seth Watha dreams and, and really dialing back and tr trying to pull it out of it. Some sort of love. And it just isn't there. It's broken. He's broken. And uh, it, 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 there's a sense of dread among that epic epicness that I've never experienced in any other series. Um, you know, even a song of ice and fire, which can be extraordinarily grim. It still has moments, you know, that are a bit um, altruistic, I guess I would say, or positive uh, where this just doesn't let up. Does it? It just kind of keeps the foot on the gas. Yeah. 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 No, it's overly tragic in many areas. <laughs> But I, I mean, I'm a sucker for tragedy. This is one of the yeah. many reasons I love this series. Um, and that I also applaud it because it is tragic instead of kind of taking the quote unquote cooler or easier mm -hmm. route, you know, uh, it it's it stings a lot. You know, even when it's cool, it's it's sad. It's fucking it's brilliant, brilliant, really. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in a lot of ways, the story sits on, like on you um, and sits with you in in a way where you can't get out from underneath it. And some of the quotes that come out in the beginning of this book, because, like you know, Mark, Mark's been kind of telling me and Amanda, you know, hey, it's going to get dark, like brace yourselves. And I think one of the opening quotes was like the shadows would begin to mutter, mutter like children testing the absence of a violent father whoa whoa talk about a tone setter uh, and th there was another quote ever are men stranded on the surface of things and ever do they confuse what they see with the sum of what matters ever do they forget the rank uh, oh, the rank and significance of the visible and when they do honor the beyond and the beneath they render it according to what is familiar they disfigure it for comfort's sake talking about this unknown and talking about this outside and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, we do really limit like the, be like what's beyond us to what we can feel comfortable with. Like we have to all kind of agree and shake our heads and say, yeah, this is, this is what we've decided. Like death is for instance. Uh, and Baker kind of tells you exactly our front, like you've messed up thinking like this and I'm going to change the way your brain works. I feel yeah, like he does a... that. Yeah. So sorry, go ahead. I was just say there's a there's some stuff in here where it starts to seem like it's play, he's playing with a theme, you know, like you're just, mm -hmm. and you're you're like, is this what he's fucking is is he is he telling me this, you know? <laughs> it, one one of the things I I pulled out that first time reading was just like, I feel like he's telling us how 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 we deceive ourselves in so many different ways, and one of the big ones I noticed was just and how we lied we deceive ourselves we lie to ourselves to smooth out whatever we need to you know, to pave the way to get to that next point, whether yeah. it's in war or all these things. And it's even as something as simple as how they call shrank skinnies. This is mm. just another thing to kind of further put them as this thing. Then it makes it more comfortable for them to hate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though the shrank are easy enough to hate as it is. It's there's so many things he's doing throughout here that it for, just personally, I was like, damn, dude, I feel like as a race, we off, we often do lie to ourselves and each other to make things right <laughs> mm -hmm. <Yeah. laughs> or be I feel at like, peace uh, with things. 
Yeah. We, we kind of did that with uh, the thing that is Soma. Like to me, because when we read it, we want to like kind of relate it to how uh, can things like make us feel and make us comfortable, like you said. And uh, like we can read the thing that is Soma like, oh, it's kind of cute. Like he loves my Mara and he's trying to protect her. And like he's, you know, maybe a, a skin spy with, you know, something good going for him. But then it's just like, or is he just kind of sent here by the consult to make sure she doesn't die? And then and, you have to ask, why is the consult so interested in my Mara surviving? Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I, me and Amanda kind of mentioned this uh, before we went live, but it's like the Synthes is talking to them and, or talking to Soma and is like, you must make sure she's OK, because whether the prophecies are false or true, we have to protect both. And I'm like, well, what prophecies are we even talking about right now? Like. There's like a whole side of this that we've never seen from the consult. And, and me and Amanda had a light bulb moment, uh, Mark, right before you joined. We we're like, we have never seen the consult's POV. We have no idea that this this third party of this triple threat is completely unknown to us. Even their motivations, like we know of the 144,000, they obviously brought a Raku, a dragon with them on the Ark. But like, to what ends exactly? I don't know. It seems like what back in... Prince of Nothing, I think we get like kind of a maybe hint of their motivations and that they're like trying to save themselves from damnation. Uh, yes. But it's kind of confusing as to like how or what they're doing to go about this goal and like their whole thing where they like they're love a race of lovers. That's why they have to. Wreck everything. <laughs> I love that. We yeah. are a race of lovers. Yeah. It's so, wild. It's so weird. <laughs> and in their perspective, it's, it's justified, you know, cause they need to get mm -hmm. uh, the population down from way. I understand 144,000 and then they can escape the outside. I believe is kind of, I, I might be getting it wrong. Uh, and I'll probably need to find out in the last two books or so. Um, but yeah, there's like this whole thing with Soma. Like, what is he? Why is he protecting my Mara? And it, do, do these things even have agency? Like, or is it literally just orders? I, I have no mm -hmm. idea. Um, so like on top of that, like the way we view Soma or any of this is also just that the plot is awesome. Like the plot is so layered and so dense. Uh, it, it's It's overwhelming almost in the best way. Yeah, Baker does a great job of kind of keeping you as a reader really in the dark about the consult, which really only adds to the, like the mysterious like kind of threat that they are, right? And I mean, you really begin to feel that as a reader because the more you push, you're like, I still don't fucking know anything about these guys. They're but they are obviously a, a, a massive threat, and I feel like the mysteriousness just really adds to the the whole you know threat of them and. <laughs> yeah I, ooh, there's, I have to bite my tongue a little bit <laughs> <laughs> which is why like I've, I've i've held off on like reading further like i don't read the next book until we do this because i don't want to i want to like my authentic questions to come out you know instead of having them answered in my head um joe nash actually says here he says about the consult's motivations you can read the short story the false son to learn about that baker released it between this book and the great ordeal so timing would be right too so maybe i will do that um depending on how long it is because i really want to get to the great ordeal but if it if it's tied in maybe i should read it hmm. i read them but i actually waited i read all of the stuff kind of in between after the great ordeal and before the unholy consult but i do believe yeah you i don't think there'd be a problem with you reading it right now before okay um uh, the Great Ordeal. The Great Ordeal and the Unholy Consul are technically like supposed to be one book. It got split into two. So, I mean, it, and realistically, it's all one story, right? But, uh, yeah, the, the Great Ordeal and the Unholy Consul at one point, I believe, were supposed to just be one book. Uh, that makes sense. Um, and, and I don't know about you two, but I feel like, Amanda, you already said, like, you kind of prefer Judging Eye. Um, for me, it's hard to separate these two. Uh, they're so close knit and a lot of like white luck warrior cannot be as good as it is without the ending of judging eye, but also like judging. eye can't be what it is without the Prince of nothing. So like I st I'm really starting to think in more terms of second apocalypse rather than Prince of nothing and aspect emperor. Do you guys feel that way that they're a little bit hard to judge as individual books? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They, yeah, they all kind of run together. <laughs> yeah. It's super tough as far as like, once you guys finish reading them, I guarantee you're being in the same spot I am, like where it's just like, it's so, so intensely hard to rank them. <laughs> yeah. And I got to give you credit because you're like actually knowing when to cut off what you're supposed to talk about. So I appreciate that because yeah, for I, me, yeah. it's it tough. all kind of flows. 
yeah it's tough it's tough but uh yeah it's it's oof. i i think uh as far as trying to that you're really on to some though it's just like it's really hard to say this one's better than the other because without the foundation of the the books that came before i mean is it the the masterpiece it is you know so uh it's it's a tough one i will say as soon as i got into the white luck warrior um and i've you know i've stated that the judging i was like the the weaker book for me personally but as soon as I got into the White Luck Warrior, it made the judging eye like yes. just it was like immediately, especially with like when we're dealing with kind of the aftermath and the state that our skin eaters are in. I really felt that right out the gate in Wild Luck Warrior. And so it made everything in the judging eye just that much more uh, like a real. It felt legit. It was like, OK, cool. Yeah, our our fucking our crew is beat up. Sorrel is crazy as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> real chopper boy yeah, the coppers <laughs> the coppers oh my god and then like there's there's more and more restrictions on the slog you know first no weepers i can understand that like you know we don't want people weeping and it's like no questioning on the slog and he's just captain's just killing people and a commune's <laughs> watching this and going i lied to these people like i'm watching this man basically trade his soul and then take these people's lives i mean it, it weighs really heavy on a commune and i think that's like one of the reasons why the grimness of the series is okay with me is because it takes a mental toll on every single character it's not just like horrible people doing horrible things and that's like eh, that's the gag um it's very much like well thought out into like the mental trauma it causes even on the person that is willingly imposing it uh, and, and I think the inspection of that is like a really tough thing to to deal with. And he goes for that challenge while also, again, maintaining a ridiculously interesting plot. So, like, it's the best of both worlds. And as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And then we get a uh, don't we get kind of the reveal that uh, like the skin eaters knew the whole time that they weren't going to the coffers or like <laughs> the whole because uh, the captain is a uh, Zaudan Yanni. And yeah. their their whole thing is like, well, we're here to escort akami in and get him where we need to go uh so it, it's almost like uh poor akami is out here just like torturing himself because he thinks he's sentenced these men to death uh, because of a lie and he's the one that's been lied to the whole time it been lied to and still controlled by kellis in some facet and yeah these are agents of kellis and it's like dude akami represents agency in the series for the most part in my opinion so it's like mm -hmm. does is does he even have agency <laughs> like i don't know i don't think but I'm not sure. And that that was one of the bigger like holy shit moments, I thought. And I thought it was also really interesting that they knew my Mara was Callus's daughter and they would not harm her, but they would not heed her. So she couldn't tell them what to do. And I thought that that kind of furthered, you know, the the idea of the patriarchy society or patriarchal society. And like mm -hmm. you could be a woman of power, but in this world, it is rough. Like it's terrible. Yeah. Um, and also, but like, why wouldn't they heed her? Like, I don't know that that part to me was like, that's interesting. Um, and my Mario Kami and themselves have so much of a mess. I mean, uh, one of the one of the passage I wrote it down here. Uh, my Mara and a commune are talking about her time as a sex slave. And uh, my Mara says, thank you. My Mara said after a time fixing him with a curious gaze for what? For not asking what all the others ask, which is how I could have stayed all those years, how I could have allowed myself to be used as I was used. Apparently everyone would have run away, slit their master's throats and committed suicide. Nothing makes fools of people quite like a luxurious life. A commune said, shaking his head and nodding. Um, Agensis says they confuse decisions made atop pillows for those compelled by stones. When they hear of other people being deceived, they're certain they would know better. When they hear of other people being oppressed, they're certain they would do anything but beg and cringe when the club is raised. Man. Like I, I read I I I'd get that tattooed on my face if I could. I <laughs> I love that. It's so good. Um and that kind of uh describes like my Mara in 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 a way, right? Of the things that she's been through and a commune can relate uh in a different facet it i don't know that was really heavy and their relationship's so messy yeah i think at one point she refers to him as like my father my mother's lover mm. my brother but also my lover <laughs> like god pick one yeah by the end you're like what the <laughs> fuck <laughs> yeah i mean that's a commune's kid right <sighs> god damn it <laughs> 
<laughs> like I was just like, please, can can we not? Like I was hoping she'd like remember. Like, oh, I didn't. Uh, nope. That is a Kamian's seed, and uh, it's unfortunate. I would say, pretty unfortunate. So, what's what's more concerning, uh, Mamara and Akamian, or Serwa and Moingas? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna. That's a, what do you guys think about that? That's a funny one because it's like uh, you know, it's you could bust down technicalities and be like, even like Serwa says, you know, there's no blood here. You know, that's there, right. There's no blood. There's no blood here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she's right, but that doesn't really change the fact that they are like adopted brother and sister. Right, no blood, no issue. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So I mean, you know, it's more of a conditioned thing. It's a, a societal condition, right? Like that's what we deem as inappropriate or taboo as a society or communities. You know, mm -hmm. um, without that kind of belief, there is actually nothing wrong that could come out of that coupling, like at least physically yeah. or whatever. You know, so it's a mm -hmm. weird thing, and I feel like Baker does a good job of zinging us with shit like that, which you know can make you think. You know, there. There's our perspective, which definitely seems like the right one, but it's the only one we got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's the, the like this that's comfortable with, with everybody. And then there's the taboo, you know? So um, I think he does a great job of kind of flicking that kind of stuff towards the reader. You know what I mean? And you could miss it or you could pick up on it. You know what I mean? It, But it's scattered throughout in all kinds of different um instances but i have to admit the first time i read the, the this book i was not comfortable with the with that coupling yeah i mean it's it was definitely a little uh i mean also like sir will's pov is just like it doesn't make it any better you no know? it's store will really my boy store will is you know his passion during this whole thing only makes it that much more uncomfortable but once again i feel like that's a great play on baker you know what i mean like they mm -hmm. like he's really kind of diving into some uncomfortable weird shit that uh does exist it's out there and especially in a time period kind of like this i don't think it'd be that odd like especially if i go back to like roman empire you know how much like incest and just all kind you know the <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah. And Dunyain, like, obviously, like, they've kept breeding inside of their own, like, people, right? So it's it's really not that far-fetched in world for this to happen. Yeah, especially exactly. For, for Yerwa, it's probably not as that strange, you know? It did seem like they, like, they thought if Kellis found out that it would be bad. Because mm -hmm. Sorwil was like, oh, I'm going to tell your dad. <laughs> so it was like, we'll, we'll kill you before you get a chance. Uh, but I, don't, I don't know. Like, how do you think Kellis would feel about that? Would he? I can't really see him. I'm at the point now where I just think Kellis knows everything. So I figure yeah. he'd just be like, I already knew. <laughs> yeah. Or like, why would I care about such a little? Like, I got. Or is he concerned? I got great ordeals to lead. I don't care. Is he concerned? I, I gave about up lineage? this whole kingdom because I have better shit to do. Why am I? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. The biggest mystery outside of the consult remains the B. Kellis and, and mm -hmm. his motivations, especially because we see Kellis for the first time start telling the truth to Proyas and saying, yeah, dude, a commune was correct. <laughs> and when he did that, I was literally like, what? Yeah. <laughs> did he just say that? And then I'm thinking, OK, he's going to take it back. Be like, I'm just I'm just fucking with you. That's, no, that's he did. A, that's a book stopper right there, dude. Yeah. When you read that part, you know, because I mean, like a way like to kind of translate that, that would be like one of the disciples hanging out with Jesus and Jesus is like, Hey bro, guess what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I lied about all this shit <laughs> or whatever. Like this thing that we're doing, it's not real. I've kind of yeah. seen you. <laughs> but if, but if you, if you're that like disciple that. and you've like seen Jesus walking on water and like, that's it. Like you bringing still, people back like, from the dead, you're like, maybe it's not that big of a deal that you kind of lied about one other Thing. Or is this a test? Is this a yeah. test of my faith? And that's what Proyas starts yeah. saying is like, is he messing with me right yeah, now? Yeah, and that, mm -hmm. like, that's why Proyas is the perfect character for the, those exchanges because mm -hmm. of the kind of person that he is and you know, mm -hmm. how he just his like forever struggle to be this perfect, faithful person, you know? Yeah. Uh, pro, right. I call him Pious Proyas, you know? He, just try, <laughs> he struggles so hard, you know? <laughs> he yeah. Everything he does, and a lot of times he makes bad decisions in you know trying to to reach this what he feels is like the right thing i that and this is one of the things that makes me love that character so much and i think it could translate into so many other people's lives hmm. where you have great intentions or you know you think you your beliefs are in the right direction but mm -hmm. 
you know, everything that they're going to kind of have you doing on the way. <laughs> it's not good. Yeah. yeah. And just keep focusing on the end goal. And even outside of Proyas, though, like this is kind of the great ordeal story, right? Like they're doing these, uh, the culling and they're now saying we got to cut some people out of this. And we kind of saw that in Prince of Nothing too, like killing all of the people who are eating that aren't actually contributing to battle or whatever. So like, it is all like, we must just get to the end. Like in, it's kind of a mirror to the slog of slogs too. It's the coffers boys, the coffers. And then, and then for a commie in the end goal, of course, is to get his map. So it's just like, everyone's kind of going towards their means and ignoring all else about their, the morality of their decisions to reach a goal that they think is worth it. So, and it's interesting because all the goals are different. They're all different and everyone is operating on a different piece of truth to themselves, like subjective truth to themselves. Um, and by Mara even at, says the Kami and like we just saw the great ordeal and like these these shrank that have been left behind that they're destroying. You cannot deny that he is at least fighting this final war, this second apocalypse. And a Kami's just like, no, I don't fucking care. Like, <laughs> I don't care. Um, and he still refuses to buy in. But even my Mara, who is pretty much on a Kami inside now, I would say, is like, yeah. But like, even if he is false, it doesn't matter. Like, he's still fighting the good fight. And that that's a that's a question in itself about the series. Right. Like mm -hmm. if he can prevent all this from ending, is it I worth think we get that a little bit with like sore wheel too. Whereas like uh, mm -hmm. Proyas is like the true believer and learning like, Oh, maybe he's not actually a prophet, but look at all this stuff he's done. Sore wheel is like almost on the, the opposite side of the spectrum, but comes to the same conclusion. Like yeah. I am not a true believer, but look at all this stuff he's doing. <laughs> like maybe so it's, it's almost like it doesn't matter. Uh, your, your perception of Kellis and whether it's good or bad, all you can see is this horde of raping skinnies. And you're like, well, we should probably do something about this. But then <laughs> like to reach this goal of, you know, stopping the apocalypse, like they're going through their own apocalypse to do it. And it's, hmm. it's like, it's so you gotta, these people gotta be wondering like, where do we draw the line of like one apocalypse to the other? Like, yeah, it sucks. It's for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it's an impossible task what they're setting out to do. Mm -hmm. So in, in like amongst along the way, they're going to have to do some impossible shit. And sometimes that is fucking foul. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Baker does once again did a really good job of in the just the the fact that these the the shrank, you know, and, and the fact that it's like you say, like people are starting to see the the hordes like crazy. We get the a real legit like full on battle and sore wheel is by, I completely understand the, the you know hit the aspect emperor's war is real you mm -hmm. know what i mean like i said regardless of what you think these fucking things are hoarding up and, and they are a massive threat like the end of the world is fucking coming this war is legit like so regardless mm -hmm. of how, where our loyalties lie we're at least doing what needs to be done and then he, uh, and, and then yeah. sorrel's getting pushed down this other path by mother and now has the tear of God of the core and then also is able to mask his his feelings like his actual emotions. So he's protected and he's kind of thinking it's like, well, I was kind of getting along here with this aspect emperor. And now I'm getting shoved down this by a different path, like, mm -hmm. a different path by a different force. Uh, so sore wheel is like in the middle of it all. Yeah. Um, uh, and he, he has his little brotherhood with uh, Zoranga, who's definitely not a believer in Kellis, but he's also kind of in love with Inanasa Rimber now. Well, I don't know about now, but uh, <laughs> yeah, he's got, and then, you know, his slave that is now dead and he feels he's, and his family legacy that he still has in the back of his head, that poor, poor solar wheel just yeah. pulled in so many different directions. I feel so badly for him, but he's performing like, pretty well like he's got the respect of uh the great ordeal now because of his actions uh during the battle to to make sure that they're warned about the uh strength army that's behind them um that battle in chapter seven i need like a painting like in the old master style mm -hmm. of this battle it's just like total darkness and the only light is coming from these witches in the sky with their, they're like poppies, like with their golden billows so floating around them. And their like eyes and mouths are lit up. Like I can never get over the like eyes and mouths being lit up. It's just always like, Ooh, what's going to happen? And they're just like blasting fire down on this like swarming 
slimy mass underneath them that you can't even really make out an individual in the crowd and you got men fight oh god it's so it, it's it's such it's such vivid imagery for something that is so foreign and mm -hmm. not familiar. Like mm -hmm. the world building is so unique and the magic even is unique to this series. So he's he's able to paint these pictures, especially for someone like me that's not a visual reader, and all this imagery that is not predicated on like past things in fantasy, like Lord of the Rings or or even Dune into, into this regard, right? And I think mm -hmm. actually that's one of the more impressive things about Dune is that I think it has like really amazing imagery for things that don't exist. Uh, like at all in any facet. And this is where like the horror side of our Scott Baker's writing comes out. And that's that different type of epic that we're, that uh, we kind of talked about before. Um, whenever the shrank are coming over the walls, whenever clerics giving his sermon at the beginning of the book, I, I don't remember what chapter it was. Oh my God. I was like, this is just like, he tops himself every single battle. Uh, easily my favorites in fantasy easily is not even close. Really? Yeah. The environments are great too that they're fighting oh. in like uh the trees that the yes. um skin eaters are walking through in the beginning of the book like the creepy ass trees and yep. you got the stone hags coming at them and mm. uh skinny's just diving off the cliff trying to follow them and cleric in the sky oh yeah it's just all so epic and so vivid so good and it just happens like mm -hmm. it's not like oh we had sets up so cleric's actually able to f be in the sky because this thing it's like no it just is and yeah. Like, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, magic yeah. i believe it i believe yeah. it yeah 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 it's done very well and yeah he's not going to explain it all either you you you're either you've, you're on, you're picked up and on board or you're probably, you're probably left in the dust <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing i i really like about uh i think this installment though too um is just really how much you see of like the god's involvement because to be honest i don't really know if it's been like really put up front that they are even really exist or that they really have any power or that they can do anything you get a little bit of like the the magic with satman on a fairy you know in mm -hmm. the white luck warrior and judging eye but really until you start to see sore wheel and like you said, the mask that the mother puts on him and how it is effective against Anasa Rembers. Yes. So now we, we know that there are gods and the real, and they, they exist and they are working with fucking, you know, pieces on the board. They're making moves and that affects the world that there are characters live in. Yeah. So you have like real proof now that the gods are in the game. And, and, Whenever he a yacht were gives Sorwheel the the tear of God, right? The core. I think there was a detail that it had Kellis's family crest on it. So does that signify that it blocks just them, or is it like something from Kellis's family that they've retrieved? You know what I mean? Like, why did it have the family crest on there? Yeah, I think Sirwa points it out to him. Like the pouch has it like embroidered. Yeah, on it. yeah. Like, yeah. oh yeah, that's my family crest. So and that's why that was... I was like, what's that? Yeah. Like, the fuck is that you know well, and then, it's all connected man and then my mara's baby I, I might be i might have got this detail wrong but i'm pretty sure soma says that my mara's baby is the judging eye that the reason why she has the judging eye and it pops up right around when she's pregnant so is like one is it symbolism like being pregnant and bringing new life is that like the ideal time to have like morale i don't know something baker's way too smart but like I, I just wonder, like, from a mother's perspective, is that why she has a judging eye? And once she bursts this kid, does she lose it? Is the kid literally the judging eye? And now the kid's going to have these powers? Like, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I also might have got that detail wrong. So the Baker fanatics can tell me if I got that wrong. But I think I remember Soma saying that to her. And I was just like, well, what's that even mean? Like, yeah, there's definitely something about uh, pregnancy. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, I, but I, I don't know if we've gotten yeah. that information spelled out for us yet well, no two prophets agree so to spare our prophets their feelings we call the future a whore i just want to throw that quote in there i don't know it felt, it felt like a good time it's, a good one. <laughs> it's such a good quote mm -hmm. there's a lot of like great quotes on fate oh. in this one too uh, i mean through the whole series honestly but like some sore i think it was like a sore will one he's talking about like uh men are so wrapped up in circumstances uh and they can't so in order to make sense of it all they have to be like oh that's fate that that whore fate like that's just what she gave me like because they can't unravel all the circumstances of, of like absurdity that surround right. them right so it's like once again it's how they deceive themselves to be able to carry on you know mm -hmm. how to yeah. fucking they have to mm -hmm. deceive themselves to live within their own world 
because otherwise they would have no grasp of, of the things around them. So, yeah. you know, and they and they, even if they begin to realize that they have no grasp of the things around them, they will quickly deceive themselves in any manner they can so that they can form whatever grasp. You know, it's it's crazy. And don't oh, we man. do that? All the That's time. what I'm saying. It's because it's like right. you can see it so translatable to the real world in, in human beings. Mm -hmm. It's nuts. Well, if you ever yeah. needed a proof of it, uh, have something that really, really bothers you and then give it like a week and it doesn't bother you anymore. And like you're just like, oh, that like didn't actually matter. But think about how much you hung on to that and how much it affected you like mentally. At least that happens to me all the time. I'll be honest. Uh, most of the time, it's like something bothers me at work or like socially. And then I'll go to like jujitsu or muay thai and i'll get the shit kicked out of me and then i go oh it wasn't that big of a deal but like it's just like you, you know you can latch on to something give it so much importance or give it insignificance however you really feel to kind of process and get through your day um yeah and i love and this is like a small thing that baker does but he always not always most of the time refers to fate as a whore and doesn't explain it he just it, it, at some point fate was called a whore and he just refers to it as the whore. And you'll think, oh, it's a character. And I'll remind myself, I go, no, they're talking about fate. And it's just like, I don't know. The fact that he trusts me to remember that, I love that. I love that. Like, he's giving me a little bit of a leash. And also, it's consistent, like, to the whole tone, mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> yeah. It's so great because, like, yeah, he, uh, we can trust him to trust us. Uh, but at the same time, like, I, I do feel still that we, we're just constantly being manipulated by him in the same way, like you guys have already mentioned, uh, kind of trying to translate the weirdness into something that we understand or something that we're more comfortable with. Um, like, Jimmy, you and I talked about back in Prince of Nothing, like, we were still under the delusion that Kellis might be able to love. Like, yeah. it's something so, like, natural to us is that we want to see, like, someone cares for someone and they, you know, want to make their lives better and they love them. And, you know, Kellis' actions kind of show that he loves Esmanet. And then in this book, he's just straight up like, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah. It, love it, is for lesser beings. It's kind of an edgelord thing to say, but... uh well, it's also interesting, though, because uh, in R Relatus, I always I say his name wrong. Um, in Relatus? In Relatus. We'll go You're with that. probably more, I say in Relatus, but I feel like in, Re in Relatus, that shit sounds way better. <laughs> 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 We're going to stick with that. In Relatus. Uh, <laughs> he says something that like, they were like, you know, your father, they threaten him with his father. And he says, father's like weakness is that his, his something about loving. Like he almost alludes that Kellis has a weakness. And I thought that was interesting. Maybe I misread it, um, but it was like that whole conversation is just like way above my head. Um, but one of the big points I've noticed when I looked at people talking about this book is how did you guys feel about Mathanet killing him? Like a lot of people did not like that because let's be honest, Aurelius is one of the most interesting characters in the series, maybe in fiction. And for him to die, a lot of people felt like that was missed potential. I have feelings about it, but I'll wait to hear what you guys say first so I can change it to the more popular opinion if I need to. So I sound smart. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, that's I thought the scene, regardless of how you felt about the outcome, is like so good in that entire um, working around of Esmanet trying to get Mathanet in front of him so that he could be judged and that he could really be, you know, seen, I guess you would call it. Um, it's pretty wild. Like, how did you guys feel about the the decision to kill him off? Uh. I was fine with it. Um, I got everything I needed out of in, in Relatus in chapter five uh, when with his conversation with Kelmomis. Uh, the whole, um, like, I've stripped, he calls something like the little armies of shame uh, that we all hold on to to, like, pretend we're civilized or something like that. He's just stripped all of it away. Like, the whole do you shit when you shit and uh, his whole, like, embracing depravity uh, to be like his true self, but it also like mm. adds to his damnation. Uh, oh man, it was so good. And there was such a good quote too. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, God punishes us, us for being near his nature, where it's like, is in Relatus the, is he close? Like, is that what the Dunyan are? Is like, they are close to the spirit of, of God. Yeah. Like, are they embodying it? Yeah, and his just, uh, th this line really got to me. Uh, the shit-stained prison cell hidden from the light of shame seemed a holy place, a temple to a different revelation, the nail of a darker heaven. Like, oh. Um, so yeah, that that whole, that <laughs> chapter, his whole conversation with uh, Kel Momis about just like depravity and stripping away all of the like pretenses that we have that, you know, allow us to live in polite society and that being like the true self and uh, something uh, worth being worshipped 
I thought was great. So uh, I'm glad we got that. Uh, I think, yeah, it could have been really cool to see what more we could have gotten with him, but I was totally happy with, with how it all worked out. And yeah, the whole, the whole Mathanet scene, having three Dunyanes in the same room was... <laughs> <laughs> kudos yeah, to Baker for writing great. it yeah, yeah kudos to him for handling it and and somehow like as Manette is like the most interesting of it all right because she's us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mark how did you feel about uh in Relatus getting chopped off um well i guess the one thing i like about it is that it was surprising oh yeah uh, you know what i mean it caught me off guard it was not uh, at all what i was expecting so I have to kind of, as much as it might not a bit, like even if you don't like it, I guarantee you were surprised at least, right? And sometimes that's the job of the writer, you know, the author, mm -hmm. is to keep you on your fucking toes, not necessarily deliver everything you want. Uh, and I think he kept us on our toes with that one. Uh -huh. Now, is there some missed opportunity? I will say this personally, I would have loved to seen or just some like one-on-one -on -one conversations between Enrilitis and Satmanana Fairy, like going off about yeah, like your yeah. one side, so like it fucking vehement about the mother. It fucking then in real life, it's probably just laughing and like going into his crazy Dunyane shit, or even in Relatus and in Fenile, Cascamandry, because Fenile mm. damn near believes himself to be like a god, like the chosen. Yeah, he is the fucking figure that God put on the planet to fucking take over and shit. So him with a lot of these other characters that have these crazy egos or just, you know, uh, I guess a sense of power would have been really fun to watch and see how he kind of dismantles them. I would have loved to see that because that's what he does. Like he'll tear everybody down in the most sly way. And that's one thing that's really, really fun about his character. Right. And then it doesn't, he's got no, uh, He's got no, like, he pulls no punches. It doesn't matter if you're his mom, his brother, his uncle, you're all going to get it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, I'm not big on the what if stuff. Like, a lot of people love the, well, what if, like, Robert Baratheon hadn't beat Rhaegar or something? I've never really been into that. This is the first time in my life, I think, with the series where, like, the what ifs are almost as fascinating as the yes. story we got. Yes. But I would never want to see it ever executed besides anyone from Baker. No one else could do this, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but the thing about Enrilatus, and I think he's playing, I think this is Baker playing with us. I really believe this. When we see something caged, when we, we see a caged animal tied up, do you not want to unlock the cage? Even if it'll eat your face, you want to see it unchained. You want to yeah. see it uncaged and Arilithus is is caged he's caged and we want to see him unleashed we say oh my god look at the potential look at the power here look at these conversations but like what happens if he's just free to roam you know we wanted to see him uncaged and baker just said nope yeah nope um I think he's a little too OP to be honest with you. I thought he served a really good purpose in the story uh, and we got just enough of him to make him fascinating and we'll always ask questions about him from here on out but if he were to live, like, I'm not sure how that, it, like, what do you do with him? Like, yeah. do, you, do you let him out? Because if you let him out, like, it can't be just something simple where he's, like, strolling down and, like, messing with people. It'd be major. Like, it'd be massive. Um, like, I think he could challenge Kellis possibly, right? So, like, I don't think there was a place for him probably going forward. And mm -hmm. it also made Mathanet, um, who we get very little of in the first trilogy, way more prominent. And oh, yeah, I love Mathanet. I love his character and I like that he got way more time, uh, especially in this book, though. I mean, we all know how it ends, but, <laughs> but and that was another surprising bit. But yeah, I really do dig uh, the fact that we get more Mathanet. And honestly, to tell you the truth, I was like, I, if like for in really to like to be killed, I felt like that the way it goes down is perfect. Yeah, like Mathan, I, for Mathanet to be the one to kill him, and, and also for in that specific circumstances, and even rolling into Kel Momus, kind of trying to fucking spin the whole thing, you know, mm -hmm. with his mother against Mathanet is so good. It's so dastardly, but you're like, fuck, this is like the craziest dark fantasy soap opera shit ever right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> and also seeing Kelmo on the back foot compared to him being on the front foot, especially, you know, towards the end of the judging eye. That was interesting. I did not expect that. I really thought Kelma was going to be the big, uh, you know, kind of like under the radar bad the whole way through. And here, I mean, he kind of gets put in his place a little bit. And I even found myself having a little bit of empathy for him, which is really messed up in a lot of ways. It is funny, right? Like, Inrilitus is the only, like, kind of the only one that really, really 
like because even Nathan Net like Kel Momus kind of has like a respect like for Nathan Net, but at the same time he doesn't like him. He wants to get rid of him. So there's also this lack of fear there. But within Relatus, there is something within his brother that fucking like you said, it puts Kel Momus in his place, and mm-hmm. it's like the only time we really see him scared. Uh, so just, you know because really it's just him kind of playing with like the world is his ant farm and now this is the first time where it, it kind of looks like he might be one of the ants and in realitas is the one shaking the fucking deal and i love that line uh that he says to his brother when he's like look at this heap of screams you call a world and tell me you would not want to add to it i'm like oh my <laughs> god dude oh so good. my goodness so good the best great character it's honestly the best yeah. I mean, we can we can kind of, we can just kind of keep going, I guess, with this storyline because we kind of talked about Mymara and, and Akamian. But you know, with Kelmo, Amanda, we were freaking out because we, we were talking back and forth. It's like worried about him. <laughs> he, and remember, you know, she kind of gets shown like, "Hey, if we ever have any issues, like you'll come here." And then he starts dragging bodies. He's like killing the knights and dragging, and he's eating them until they spoil. Like yeah, what? He's, there's like a line of like, "Oh, next time I'll have to eat them before they get cold." <laughs> Kelmo, come on. Oh my god. Like, you can't steal some meat from the kitchen. You gotta eat Did, these guys you're killing. I seriously think some of the Kelmoma stuff is like among the most horrifying things I've read, not just like in fantasy or in this series. I mean like if anything I've read. Yeah, and- I just love stabbing people in the eyeballs and uh he like misses <sighs> once he like tries to get it in the tear duct. It's like he's like lobotomizing people uh so he can like taunt them <laughs> before he kills them. Uh, but once he like misses and accidentally like stabs him in the eye and through the brain, he's like, oh man. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, Kelmo, what are you doing? Like I'll do better next time kind of deal. And it's like Kelmo. Like I was like, oh, Kelmo's a cannibal now. Like that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, that let me look inside your mouth, little brother. Oh my God. Yeah. What is that? Creepy. And, and, and Creepy. with Baker, I'm like, does that mean it's something more? <laughs> you know what I don't. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! Yeah, so Calmomus is you know playing hide and seek, <laughs> hide seek and eat you. That's yeah, night off trial nights, nights fucking for snacks. Yeah, <laughs> crazy, mm-hmm. crazy. If this kid gets the power, uh, I don't know what would happen. Um, and then the flip- Kelmo with like the gnosis. <laughs> please no <laughs> please no or everyone's everyone's screwed i mean they're already screwed let's be honest the world's terrible everyone uh, but mommy it could always get worse i guess uh but mommy or esme is now over in the whorehouse right she's been saved by uh the one guy and i can't remember his Inhalus? name is that it yeah it's like her bodyguard that she's in love yeah, with Inhalus, yeah yeah I, I love that entire section whenever she's there. And then you have the um, the whore uh, Nari. Is that her name? Yeah, I think so. Nari. Yeah, and Halis is like, uh, like not a wife, but like girl or whatever, like girlfriend or like lover. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and he's going to visit her and they're staying there. And then Esme's thinking about the time back, you know, whenever she was a prostitute. And Esme holding the knife to her throat was somehow so disappointing to me because she saw everything she used to be in this girl and she like would rather it be dead, right? Like she had no compassion for the position that she was in. And as me thinking that hearing uh, Nari sleep with men was to hear her old self still existing was so heavy. And just, I don't know, whenever she like turned on, on her and held the knife to her throat, I was just like, Oh no, as going down a road, I didn't want her to go down. Uh, very disappointing, but in like a great way, right? It's executed very well. And unfortunately it's probably very realistic. Um, yeah. Even- that's one of my favorite parts of with Esmonet in this whole series. Cause of kind of same exact reasons. It just, it hits heavy. There's a very mirrored moment where she's, you know, like she sees herself in this girl and she's getting to reflect on, on her past. And yeah, there's all this conflict inside her and all this shit that's just going on in, in moment. And, it's it's heavy for her yeah while worrying about her kids yeah and she's been abandoned by her husband essentially Mm -hmm. (sighs) yeah and and yeah not supposed to move around like all the other uh prostitutes are supposed to think she's like nari's ailing mother and like even just like from being the empress to having to like beg a prostitute to use her chamber pot Mm -hmm. like that's rough and esme had like an earlier uh little internal monologue thought about like uh, the nobles hate me because I'm not 
supposed to have achieved this status. And then the commoners hate me because they will never achieve this status. So like everyone hates me for it's, it's sad. Like on one hand, it's great to see her have ascended to her position and be where she is after such a terrible life. But then on the other hand, like, yeah, she's never going to be accepted anywhere now. And yeah. Cause yeah. you kind of realize that position is cursed for her. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, as much as it's a win, it's not at all. Yeah. Like people it see my face on a coin and just remember like uh, paying to fuck me. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Right. That's like sad. To, to kind of a double meaning there in, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. Cause you know, there was probably back whenever she was a prostitute that then that would look at their coin would probably think of her. And now people actually look at the currency and really do think of her. Yeah. Wow. And use the currency to buy sex wow. from people who dress up like her. Wow. So it's a crazy position to be in. She can't escape it. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's all because of Kellis and her decision of what she thinks is a decision to pick Kellis over a commune. And we see that regret going through and through while also seeing my Mara think about her mother's decision as well. So we're seeing it from two different perspectives and like a commune in the present tense as well. And my Mara mulls over the fact that she can understand sometimes why Kellis was picked over a commune while also then seeing like, you know, positives in a commune as well. And why she did love him at one point. It's just, uh, the lineage and stuff. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. It's, it, it's crazy how layered it is. Um, I thought Nathan net and Esme's conversation was excellent right, right before he is killed. And they're kind of talking back and forth about how they both really fear Kellis and, you know, that he left them there to their own devices on purpose. And they kind of come to this conclusion that they must work together. And you're almost thinking like, are these two going to join forces? Are these two going to try to buck back? Like, what is the plan? And then without, <laughs> any warning i i totally forgot that he existed the assassin the white luck warrior same kills mathanet and i didn't guy. i didn't even know it was a white luck warrior until after the book someone told me and i go oh my god i'm dumb like and that made the ending so much e even better than it already was oh yeah it's fine it's yeah at you're just like, that moment where mathanet and esme are you know, kind of making amends and they're they decide they know that Kellis has kind of fucked them and they're gonna work together and push forward and fucking try to save moment and everything and then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like Baker didn't even give us it, you know. And oh would, yeah. my god, damn it, you fucker. <laughs> he like steps out from behind the statues. My first thought, because we kept getting that uh white luck warrior perspective of him like stabbing and killing Esmonet. Uh, so, and I totally forgot that she even put the hit out on Mathanet by this point. So I'm like, oh no, he's going to kill Esme. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought too. Cause I had forgotten. I said, oh, it's Esme's time to go. And then he kills mm -hmm. Mathanet. Yeah. And you're like, oh yeah, that hit that we put out. Whoops. That you know, is so right, right after he says like, we're going to stage a great reconciliation and, oh, uh, ouch. And, and did, and my question is, is Mathanet, you know, obviously he's half done Yane. Like, it, did he know it was coming? Does he know? Like, does he have any idea? Because his death, it almost seems like, I mean, obviously he couldn't do much about it, but it almost felt like a concession in some ways. And then he says, Esme, please tell Kellis. And we never find out what he wanted him to say. He kind of, in his last words, he says something along the lines of like, tell Kellis. And then he dies. And you're like, tell him what? <laughs> tell him what, Mathanette? <laughs> You waited five books to be the be the dude, and now you're just gonna leave. You know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it was uh, it's shitty to see Mathanet go. I do like the character, and I I would have been nice to see more of him. But I mean, like everybody's got a part to play in this story, and the, and yeah. there's you know, yeah, that was Mathanet's. Shit. Love how Esmonet just just picks it up and runs with it, though. Yeah, like, like you know, she goes go, runs with the teachings of Kellis and yeah. starts. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they call it? Spilling the oil or whatever. Or... Yeah, yeah, like yeah. speaking oil, which is speaking something that oil, also yeah. reminds me. Like it's almost to me, it's like she's speaking the oil, and it's like the lantern that's going to set everything alight. And it like just calls back to me again, like the lantern light coming from people's mouths. Like this is Esme's sorcery. Like wow. this is the light coming from her, like what she can do, and uh, she pulls it off uh, she's like you know if you don't bow to me right now you are like this is blasphemy against your aspect emperor and uh at first people are a little hesitant but the more she talks it up and she just does not relent and it is like a like i was like yep hail as me at the end of that chapter because she, that she's embraced it you know mm -hmm. people hate her for things she's never done and she's like well <laughs> time to yeah. put on the mask time to play yeah. the role yeah and she does a great job i think that was a yeah. amazing end to that chapter yeah 
I, uh, I, I loved Esme's arc here. Um, I think it is a massive change for her. Like, it, it, if anything, out of everyone in the in this book, I think Esme probably went through the biggest changes. Yeah, big time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I there, did kind of want to. Oh, go ahead. There, I was going to say the the other like part, just the big thing about this book that I uh, <clears throat> really like. We were kind of touched on earlier, just as like how much we really are got, like starting to get involved with the ordeal you know mm-hmm. and we're seeing like things that this is stuff that i kind of glossed over the first time but i really like enjoyed the second time and it's like things like uh like the whipping of sebawol or sibawol where mm-hmm. he's ba- like you know you got sarayan and his famiri riders and and they're like having success because they go into battle unarmored and after you know sibawol has been whipped and he's like trying to take a note out of you know, Soroyan's book and it doesn't really work out for him. He ends up getting whipped again. You know, these are like things that are like actually like historical when when like revolving around the, the ordeal. Like this was stuff that would have been docking. You know, it was the first, you know, time a captain was whipped in the ordeal. So, yeah. you know, what I mean, and me, that's like just a detail. But still, like it, when you start to like kind of come back the second time around, it's these details that really add to the epicness of this story. And you got scenes like where <clears throat> where you get Zachary's the the mandate who comes into the fold and all these people are like, oh, fuck, yeah, Zachary's is here. But then you get the guy. Uh, what's his name? Is it Karen Dusu or whatever? The guy from the Vocalati who's just constantly throwing shade on his, you know, his plans mm-hmm. and his ideas and shit. Yeah. And then eventually we get that moment in during uh, the, the battle where is I believe it's Karen Dusu who goes fucking ape shit and he's fucking shit up and then we get the whole showdown between the mandate and the vocalati so it's like <laughs> oh, that, was, that was hard to read itself. yeah it's when all the crazy. all the soldiers on the battlefield are looking up and they're like uh yeah wrong target <laughs> like, insane insane yeah and it's so also sad. it's like one of those things where it's like that guy's name was stricken from the records yeah you know what I mean? Like it's once again, it's maybe not a like super integral to the plot, but it's these little things with the second time around that make it so epic. You're like, oh fuck, man, that was the they struck his name from records. Oh <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, and, and they're all going, they're chasing glory in a way, right? Like that is one of the motivators to the great ordeal and, and how they kind of convince people to go and do it, uh, outside of Kellis being Jesus, but um, you know, they are chasing the glory and to have your name stricken, I would imagine for the sacrifices made, it has to be one of the biggest like spit on your grave moments in this universe. So uh God. Yeah. Uh I feel like the great ordeal is probably out of everything. The thing I remember the least about, which not, not soil, but the great ordeal. So those are things that I'm really looking forward to on a reread. Uh, yeah, a lot I, of it's because of the names, the names are so really, hard to remember. It's, it really makes sense for that part to be, because, you know, besides your key characters, there's a lot of stuff being thrown at you. You know, yeah. Baker doesn't shy away from with hitting you with a hundred different names and they're all very esoteric. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> especially when they all split into like four different columns. Yes, and you have them just everywhere, and they're all dealing yeah. with their yeah, own, can get kind their of own version of yeah, like starvation. And then the non-man comes. Yeah, yeah, the non-man Ooh, comes. Yes, this, this. the arrival of the non-man that was really mm-hmm. cool, right? The chariot and everything. Yeah, that was dope. And then he's like, "Well, you have to send an enemy. Uh, what is it? Like a lover, a, a son, a daughter, and an enemy? Or is yeah, it? son, a daughter, and an enemy. And then they were like, "Oh, don't worry, you're a false enemy. Yeah, so like, you're fine." <laughs> And then he's over uh, here in the bushes. Poor sore wheel. Yankee panky. Just I don't know, that whole thing is so ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it's very uncomfortable. Very, very. uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and that's just. Yeah. That's Baker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Baker does has no problem making you fucking squirm at all. Uh, you know? The darkest thing I think I may have ever read in in the series and maybe fantasy is when uh the captain is abusing my mara or um, i'm sorry not uh, not the captain but um uh Ga- Ga- galleon? Galleon? Ga- galleon galleon yeah, yeah towards the end yeah yeah and uh the crimson butterfly a small child whenever she's staring at him with a judging eye and think about his damnation and the things he's done and she sees uh the handprint of a small child and he she calls it the uh, crimson butterfly I like, it shook me to my core. 
I was like, damn. Cause like, again, he's not being overly descriptive and grotesque, but the, uh, there's a lot of levity to that. There's a lot of weight to that. And I, I told my wife about it after I was like, man, it's like, this messed me up. Like, this is the darkest shit I've ever read. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, it seems like she, really dark. yeah. Mamara like, uh, like forgives him near the end when they're all about to rape her. Uh, and she looks at him with a judging eye again and, and she's like, uh, she's like, I can see all of your sin, all of the good you've done. And if you like do this, it's over for you. And, but she like has the power to let everything go for him. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. And is, that, is that a mother's love? Like, is that why the child might be the judging eye? Like that, that's the kind of thing. Cause you know, like a mother forgives it's child, you know, the child. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. But I have, I have my own uh, issues with how, like motherhood and pregnancy is portrayed in books. Um, yeah. And, and that was something maybe like a little nitpick that I had with this one. Uh, like, oh, Mamara is uh, pregnant now. Uh, like, oh, I wonder what this drug is doing to my, not that that's not a legit worry, but just the whole, uh, I don't know, perspective change of like, you hear like, oh, you never know anything stronger than a mother's love, or you can't actually love anything until you have a child and, and all of that. I just, I don't know. I kind of take issue with that, but for us, for personal reasons, um, and I well, don't know how big the deal that is. I won't be surprised if that is subverted <laughs> in the next two books, because that kid is not going to, it's not going to go well. It's going to yeah. go poorly. Yeah. Very, very poorly. Um, yeah. That's something I'm going to keep an eye on too, because I know that's something that bothers you because we, we've talked and whatnot. Um, and I, I that but that's also when I was reading this, I was like, is that going to be something he plays with? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm really not sure. I think I'm also probably wrong in the baby being the judging eye. I feel like that might be incorrect. So let's I won't run with it. Um, it was in my questionable notes. I have a thing where I said, did I miss this? And then like, it's in that section of my notes. Uh, so I, I always try to uh, put out the caveat that I might be completely inept when it comes to reading. So same. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, like with the whole white luck warrior thing, I'm I'm still I'm still confused about that. All I know is that the white luck warrior should be the one to kill Kellis, I think. I think. You think Kellis is gonna die? No, but I think that's the white luck warrior's role. Mm -hmm. um, it is. So But yeah, isn't I mean, Sorwheel better like isn't he more suited to be the white luck warrior? I mean he has the mask <clears> that like it keeps the family crest of our you know all the stuff that around Sorwheel. I'm like, I feel like he's the white luck warrior. That's funny that you say that because I feel like when I was first reading these books, the more further I pushed, I began to create like craft this theory that was like, I think Sorwheel's the white luck warrior. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because I was like, he's the one, like he's like easily making it, you know, like deceiving the, the he's deceived Kellis. Yeah. Already. You know what I mean? Like he's the only one that can get in close enough. You know what I mean? And he's a tear uh, of God. Like I, I, I'm and just like, got, and he's got the weapon. Right. So you're like, well, fuck dude. Like maybe, you know, like, I feel like you're probably like having a lot of similar thoughts that I had too. you know, going through it. There's, there's so much going on. So many moving pieces. Wow, and, so and too, like when you're you're obsessing about some of the shit and then he hits you with fucking amazing stuff like a goddamn king of dragons yes <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> dude that I'm whole like, section was just uh what is it the wootiat is, is the wootiat, yes oh dude, wootiat is so good so <laughs> good the stuff that he spouts is so epic dude. in all big capital letters too oh, oh so good so yeah. good yeah, and he's like a blind, undead raccoon. And then we find we and the cool thing <laughs> is we get to learn more and more about all this stuff, right? Like we learn that raccoons never stop growing. Yeah. So they're you know, like that is awesome. It's like completely <laughs> made metal, like different yes, metals. And then, so like the, the iron bones and stuff that we we witnessed in the previous book, things are beginning to kind of make sense more. And mm -hmm. it's just like, what the fuck? And, and the then Wootiot gives us all kinds of info, you know, like he's, you know, whether he's a liar or not, he's at least giving us fucking information that we have not been hit with yet. Right. Yeah. And I like art, how, I like how we get it too. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Yeah, Cause, cause they, they make the deal. Like, uh, he's like, uh, you give me some truth and I'll give you, mm. uh, what, what you need. And so, uh, his whole, like, isn't, is truth not infinite? Like is everything not truth? Like therefore, what are you going to give me? Uh, like, when is it enough? And so that's kind of how it's like a good exposition vehicle 
for us to get some more information. Uh, it was like the deal that they made. And then, yeah, the battle's just epic. Yeah. It, it I can't remember smile. what he says. Like a commune says something about like they're talking during that whole like truth exchange deal. And he's in like Utiat says, I can't remember the word. He says, and so something becomes scripture and God becomes or greed becomes God. But it was like, oh my God, I wish I could remember the whole thing because it's so good. It's, it's like a fire hydrant of just so good. good shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but, you get the, we get hit with information. It's like Wutiat's telling him, it's like, this is like not the first fucking place we've been to. We've been to other yeah. worlds. We've yeah. diminished the population down to the fucking 144,000. And still, we are, you know what I mean? Still looking for that answer. And like, there's a pretty good chance, right? That the, probably the entire prophecy is all hogwash and like misinterpreted. And like, like it's someone, it's a whole nother species, like religious journey that is probably predicated on false documentation. You know what I mean? It's just like, what, <laughs> what? And uh, this is where the Tolkien stuff really crosses over for me. Like, I'll never let that go that you, since you said that Mark ever. Uh, and this is smile. Like this is yeah. Hobbit. And yeah. yeah. And I just read The Hobbit like two months ago, and I was just like, holy shit, like Baker is such a student of the game. Like he knows exactly what he's playing with here. Yeah, it's dope. Like, and that's it, too. It's totally it's it's Smaug, but it, it's Wutia. You know, it's Baker. Yeah. It's Baker's ver version of Smaug, and it is done so goddamn well. And the exchanges mm. between Cleric and Wutia. Like at one point, because you get a commune and Wutiat are talking, and then all of a sudden, cleric, you kind of almost forget cleric is there. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> he kind of like comes in and he's like talking shit to the Wutiat. He's just like, You're like, you've deceived yourself, you raku Jeroy. <laughs> that moment is like, I was like, I bet you Jimmy loves this because this is almost the equivalent like of a wrestling match. When the and guy the comes out, out from backstage during like a during an altar, and like everyone stops, is like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, and we're just waiting for Cleric to like snap off. Like I was just the whole end of this, I was just waiting. And I even had a moment, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I honestly was not sure if a comment would win the fight. I I was like, is Baker because he's he's killed Nathan it. He 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 killed all these other characters. I'm like, is he gonna kill off a commune? Like right as they get to the coffers yes like that's exactly what i say is it, he got to the coffers it's gonna go yeah. poorly yeah and it, it did go poorly oh uh, terrible <laughs> you're like buried under treasure and they're like oh the dragon senses us by hearing because he's blind so you gotta be quiet and they're all trying to <laughs> dig their way out of the treasure <laughs> quietly and yeah not fall into this dragon's trap uh, yeah, no, the, says, do I remember rightly? The dragon doesn't die when it's yeah, no, he off. doesn't Crest die. Fly he, off. Wu Tiat flies off, and mm -hmm. the, the the you know the shit there too is that during that exchange, he even says, you know, not even the Black Heaven commands me. So <laughs> fucking Wu Tiat ha has can do whatever the fuck Wu Tiat wants Let's to do. Let's go. You know what I mean? Let's he ain't go. gonna. He don't have to listen to the consult. He can fucking do whatever he wants, and that is fucking terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying enough that he'd be a consult weapon. Uh, but imagine, you know, a dragon that old. Fuck, dude. And I think and about this dragon know. as like a machine alien. Like, and that's the other thing. It's like. Wu, Wu Tia also, you could say, like, through that exchange, he's like, he wants them to, like, he wants the world to end. He's wait. He's like, has the world ended? Come back to me when the world's over. Come back to me when it's ended. Like, so <laughs> imagine a guy who's been waiting for the world to end is now just cut loose on the fucking world. You know, I mean, that that mm. was my first thought when I read it. I was like, oh, my God, the world's going to burn. <laughs> oh, give me the Wu Tiat slice of life novel, Baker. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh and, man. Yeah, it's wild. Um, the The thing that stood out to me the most in this whole book that I got, I read this line and I like had to set it down. Uh, was Kellis telling the great ordeal after he shows up and kind of saves the day, like walks through the sky over and puts down everything? He says, Henceforth, we will eat shrink. We eat shrink. Holy shit. Dude, that is a uh, fucked up moment, right? Uh, oh. <laughs> like, can you imagine? Like, we just like <laughs> slogged through all these like dead shrink bodies, and there's like birds coming down and eating their eyeballs, and they're just like disgusting. And dinner's served. I, it, it, 
Yeah. And they're fighting for humanity and and to be men, right? <laughs> the non-men, the con, all this stuff. And it's like, uh, what point what does humanity break? Into? Yeah, what are they turning yeah. into? Is this an evolution? Are we watching evolution? Dude, that was one thing that uh, was really fucking with my head the first time through. I started coming up with this weird theory that the fucking ordeal was slowly becoming shrink. Oh, shit. You know what I mean? And I had some really crazy off the wall theories you know what i mean and i mean like really nutty <laughs> you know what I mean? they didn't they weren't true but i mean it was like that this is where baker puts you you know what i mean they're like yeah. this this theory is asinine and totally off the wall but when it comes to this series it could be applicable <laughs> it's all valid it's yeah. all valid yeah. <laughs> yeah. like fuck this like, is that it's it's so epic and like so much is happening and like the writing really draws you in. But if you like take yeah. a step to just like put yourself in the mind of one of these soldiers that's in the great ordeal, like it is so bad. <laughs> like, yeah, like it, it, the whole thing starts with he like cuts off all communication back to the Empire mm -hmm. uh, because like like they're saying the Empire's falling apart and we're not going to go fix it. So. Uh, if if people learn, um, like they're right. here to save their wives and children, and if they learn that their wives and children are just dying back home anyway, they're going to leave. Uh, so, and and it's it's almost interesting. Like he kind of uses that as a double, uh, like from two fronts. Like for yeah. one thing, cutting off communication so that nobody deserts. Uh, but on another hand, to do what he does to uh, Esmanet and Mathanet and kind of let things fall apart back there because it's it doesn't seem like he needs it anymore. Um, so from that, like you no longer have any idea what's going on at home. And then, you know, you're split up into your columns and you're super hungry and dehydrated and being attacked every night, can't get any sleep. Yeah. And then you watch your, like Mark in your, in your spoiler video, I thought, uh, nailed it with like, you're on the battlefield and whether you're fleeing or going forward, you're seeing your comrades, like die and then their dead bodies are getting fucked <laughs> and like that and then to be like finally brought back from the brink by your god emperor that comes and saves you and he's like okay now we're gonna eat these things like oh my god just dude i mean yeah just imagine fuck. the psychological impact of that right like yeah so it, messed up it's actually interesting because a lot of times like erickson talks about this in malazan he actually chooses a little bit of a more non-important pov and like the small man and the marines rather than giving like an animate or rake pov because he says well I'll think about like the mystique around those characters and now like they're like larger than life to the reader baker does the opposite where he's giving us the leaders and the people who are making these decisions and then we are given the task and the responsibility to then think about this and think about the everyday soldiers sitting in the ranks going through this stuff and i would actually say both are equally fascinating um we're watching the chess players move but it's up to us to think about the impact you know for the for the uh, pawns uh and it, it's a very interesting way of taking it and i think a lot of people in fantasy author wise do this. They they pick the big players, right? They have sword wheels, the Kellis is all this stuff. Now Kellis also still is a distant POV, which is why he's amazing, right? Because you could never. I mean, you could, but it'd be it'd be tough. Anyways, uh, a lot of people do what Baker does, and and has a lot of the more prominent POVs that are really really important, uh, but they don't necessarily even ever consider the small people. Um, it's something that uh, I think Stormlight Archive actually misses a lot. Like uh, it has really big epic moments, and you know Kaladin's there, and he's just like me, and blah 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 blah. But like the everyday townspeople i don't know anything about these everyday townspeople at all uh and baker does a really good job of putting that pressure on you to to consider the humanity of it um and that's a really really good point and i also enjoyed that piece of your video mark by the way that was uh that was definitely one of the uh fa my favorite parts of your review um and we see the great ordeal happening right we see a commune and cleric fighting and a dragon and then they're fighting each other and then there's like this really really intimate moment with my mara where she realizes that she's naked and it's like the most downright interpersonable like human moment in the book and it's like masterfully done but it's horrible and it's just interesting because we're seeing like cannibalism like they're gonna eat shrank the dragon you know has flown away and we're seeing this big wizard battle and then you just have my mara and she her big revelation is that i'm naked like that is so abstract to what's going on. It's it's the best. It's the best. Yeah. 
It's the best series ever, probably. How he yanks you from like the huge epic cinematic to like the small intimate just does it all from POV to POV. Yeah, it's it's yeah, one of those little small intimate exchanges for me definitely came in the form of when uh after they burned cleric and they see they they see sorrel kind of like yes. kind of spying on them sort of so to speak like in the distance and in my mara take you know catches the leaf as it's falling and she kind of makes a little envelope or whatever and puts some kiri in it and like sets it out you know and Kami's like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm not even really sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you know, you know that she's leaving it for Sarl. Mm-hmm. And it's just a it's a weird fucking thing, right? Because at this point, Sarl's just a crazy bastard. He's got the, the <laughs> captain's head sewed into like bearded right into beard. his fucking beard. I mean, he is absolutely fucking ape shit bonkers. And probably <laughs> you'd want to be as far away from this crazy bastard, but it's this like gesture of my Mara's. That really like almost humanizes uh sorrel back like he it makes him almost this innocent person in this moment like that he's gonna yeah. need that like he's he's gone you know what yeah. i mean and like god damn this is almost like a mercy for for this man and yeah. i don't for me it was so weird because i was so moved by that moment it's such wow. a little kind of moment and it might not mean anything to anyone but to me personally it was gigantic I mean, it was stuff that made me almost like start tearing up. I was, yeah. I felt a lot of emotion, like impact in that moment. It was really, mm-hmm. really cool. I felt a similar one um, when Mamara is trying to get on like Sarl's good side uh, to try and suss oh. out what the captain and uh, cleric are doing because they keep talking and she's like, I want to know. Let me like buddy up with Sarl. And he's obviously ain't got nothing like coherent to tell her. Uh, but she's like talking to him and then she kind of gets caught. And so she's like, oh, just hanging out with my buddy Sarl. And then uh, <laughs> Sarl, uh, he's, he like looks at her and has this like a moment of lucidity and says, it's been lonely. It's like, I mean, he befriends a boulder. It's true. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. But just, just him telling her that it's been lonely. Like, yeah, he has yeah. been abandoned to his insanity. And everyone mm-hmm. kind of looks at him like a meme. Uh, and so do we, because he's making friends with boulders. Uh, but like, there's still a soul in there that feels the loneliness like through his insanity and so yeah no i i I laughed at him but at the same time yeah no i i I got pretty emotional about sarl in this book too i i almost didn't really get at the end that he just stayed at the coffers i thought he was i thought he was going with them coffers boys yeah Yeah. it's a very like i mean it kind of just kind of happens really quick so it's kind of like if you if you're reading too quick you would really like probably gloss right over it yeah, but it's uh, it's for me. It was a heavy moment, and it really mm-hmm. not only is it it's like this really endearing moment and just a, an awesome gesture on my Mara's part. Uh, it gives a little bit more dimension to Sorrel as well. I think I agree. He, it, like you say, he's kind of it. Like a time at that, like throughout most of the book, and someone just he's barely lucid. He is kind of a meme. He's crazy as fuck, you know. And he's just spouting the he's spouting his catchphrases, basically, <laughs> like the coffers. Like, you know, the world's our peach, boys. Like, oh gosh. <laughs> or he still, you know, he still cries for Kiampus, which is something that's kind of always I always yeah. found interesting. You know, Kiampus, yeah. Kiampus. You yeah. know, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. So yeah. So in a lot of ways is the reality of, of everything that, that happens in the series. Like when we're talking about just the levity of it all, uh, Sorrel kind of embodies the madness and, uh, he's definitely my favorite side character in the series for sure. Uh, I want to mm-hmm. highlight what Tony Miller said. He said, the consumption of strength is the shortest path that Golgoth, Golgoth wrath. I can't say it. Uh, it is a pure application of logic, which tracks with Kellis. The bigger question is what happens to men when they consume or become their enemy? How does the, how do the seeds of debauchery set in? How does it grow? How does it change the men? Mm-hmm. And Mitch says, Charles an NPC. It's interesting. Yeah. And that's what I was saying. Like, this is where you like, just when I started going off the rails with my, like think it was like, well, fuck if they're there, the way that the ordeal is moving, cause it's not like, it's not going to get any better for them. They're only going to be tried more and more the further they push. Um, and you know, we all like know that war is going to bring out a very animalistic and primitive side, criminal. God, am I saying that primitive, primitive, yeah, primitive, yeah. primitive uh, side of you anyways. Right. Mm-hmm. So, like it does feel like the our our men of the t- when well, they're not men of the tusk they're men of the ordeal now so mm-hmm. it feels like they very much are 
um, becoming the very thing that they fight and wouldn't yes. consuming them just further put you in that, right? Like, and so maybe they're not physically becoming shrink, but there's still something mentally there that's happening, right? Like, fuck it. Yeah. They are very much so becoming just as vicious and wicked as the very things that they face. Yeah, Baker moves between the, like, uh, metaphorical and the reality like reality very well even in his subtext it, it's i think that's what makes this series so amazing and why you can start getting off into these crackpot theories because you're just like well wait like what is meta like i don't even know what's meta anymore in this series like i don't know when he's just talking to me and whenever he's talking to the character it's fascinating shit i mean it's, it's mind-boggling and then like the end of this book we find out that issue out is just another dead place beyond the glacier like oh. what? Like what kind of ending is that? God. Yeah, you've been trying to get here this whole fucking time, and you get there, and you're like, what? Oh, man. But we will be picking up with Ishwal, so maybe it's fucked up. But yeah, Baker just—he's that guy, man. Every time you kind of think you're kind of plugging along, and he might even string you along to where you think it's gonna go the way it should, what you it should go. <laughs> pulls the rug out. But nope, nope, that's not what we're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, so good. I think uh, I think we covered most of the book. I think we got a, a lot of it. I obviously want to be respectful of uh, your guys' time and everyone uh, that's tuning in as well, obviously. Um, ben Brown does say, Mark, I just finished on Holy Consult. Hold me. <laughs> So that is concerning. Uh, yes, I like I tell everyone like you should have like a it's good to have a little support group for the end of that book. I'm thinking about doing I thought about doing a reading vlog for the Unholy Console. Cool. I've never done one. Um the closest I ever got to doing it was the last book of Malaz, and I really consider doing it for that because like it's just such a monumental thing. I'm not saying I'll do it, but I may film myself like as soon as i'm done reading the sections like how i feel um, right right that speed. would be interesting man i would like really like, i'll set my personally i think the battle like gogodoroth is the best battle ever written in fucking fantasy period you know what i mean and that's not really a spoiler yes. to say this this about talk about the battle because come on we all know it's it's coming happening. yeah it's coming it's, it's what the whole fucking series is about so, so it's, it's not a fucking spoiler to say there's a battle at gogodoroth and it's the most epic shit I've ever read in my entire life. I don't think it'll ever be beat either. Like it is Damn. insane. It's, I'm a, so like, it's a big, big, big chunk of the book. So, I mean, and you can already see, like we've been, you know, along the way, you've seen how he's kind of portrayed battles so far, and they just keep goddamn getting better, right? Yeah, but that's one thing you can always expect from Baker. Uh, all right. Well, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I kind of want to read this short story, but I might, I don't know. I might wait. Maybe I'll read it like while I'm waiting to read on Holy Consult, like before the discussion, if I finish. Yeah, I think you could do that. And I don't think it would like, I don't think you'd be missing out any on anything okay. going into the great ordeal. And you just, and then you can add the knowledge to your, you know, your little mental library there before jumping into the unholy consult. Perfect. That's I what mean, I'll do. Even if you never even read the show, I would suggest you read it. But I mean, even if you never did it, uh, it would be, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't like be so crucial that you wouldn't understand the book or something, you know. Okay, good, good. So I'll probably read the great ordeal, and then while I'm waiting for us to do the discussion, I'll I'll probably read it if I have time. People are saying it's super short, so that shouldn't be a problem. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I'll. It is do short. It. Yeah, maybe I'll do it like right after. I don't know. Uh, if someone said these Baker chats are the best. I agree. I agree. This is like one of my favorite series to talk about, to be honest. Yeah, this and, is a lot of fun, guys. Yeah, honestly, I love having you both on. Amanda, Mark, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. I know, you know, taking an hour and a half out of a weekend is is a task uh, for anybody. And for you guys to decide to share it with me and with everybody, I, I genuinely appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. So thank you guys. Yeah, yeah these are like the, the us, highlight man. of my yeah, months yeah. now. Yeah, this is the ultimate reading experience. Like, I'm not yeah. going to lie. Like, it's going to be hard to fill this void after it's going to be really, really hard. The, the yeah. Baker, the Baker blues are a real thing. <laughs> They're a real what do, thing. What do we, uh, I know we, we have two books left, but Mark, what do we read after this? To Man, it was a tough one. For me. I DNF like five books after the Unholy <laughs> no. Consult. And the one that actually I had success with was, um, gosh, darn it. It was the second book in the chasing graves trilogy. So unfortunately for, <laughs> Unless you've read book one of Chasing Graves. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, You'll but the book two of Chasing Graves was so goddamn amazing. I was so I, I hit up Ben Galley and was like, dude, this thing's insanely good because literally I have been in such a reading slump and this thing pulled me out. It was so well, 
Chasing Rage is a really good trilogy. I would definitely put on your guys' radar. It's a, an amazing self pub trilogy. Chasing Ben Galley is a great, a fantastic writer. It's oh, uh, it's a very cool concept. You're dealing with like uh, shades. They're like ghosts that are indentured servants. <laughs> it's 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 very funny and dark at the same time. It looks looks promising. I just put it on my TBR. Yeah, it's pretty good. But anyway, yeah, that was the book that slammed me out of my slump. Really, it's really tough. I because like you say, it's just the his prose, like the way mm -hmm. he's plotting all this stuff is so next level. That when you get into something else, it, it can be kind of underwhelming real quick. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah. well, well, this isn't, you know. Yeah. And, and I really do like fast paced, like not, you know, kind of bare bones reads a lot of the times too, just as much as I like a, you know, a dense, thick epic. Um, but after the, this shit is just so much, and it, it will, you get attached to it. And it's yeah. like, uh, it's a personal journey by the end. So, it you understand that and it's hard to kind of find another book that resonates with you like that and you might have to kind of just accept the fact that you might not find one like that but you can still enjoy books oh yeah. certainly yeah i'm not a big believer that like uh things ruin other things it's just that yeah. you get a better idea of what clicks for you and what yeah, doesn't yeah, and yeah. like all art there's great there's good and there's bad like it just and it's all up to you to decide what what lands i know i'm going to read other stuff like uh neuropath i'm going to read and then he has um some other books like Disciple of Disciple Dog or Disciple, Disciple of the Dog. Disciple of the Dog, I think, is what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I'm going to read everything he's ever published. So <laughs> that's happening for sure. Yeah. yeah. Neuropath is definitely on my uh, on my horizon. It's good. Awesome. Yeah. yeah Amanda yeah, loves that's it. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to get into it for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quick, though, uh, I, I really liked that we did get we didn't get a whole lot of uh, Death Came Swirling Down in this book. But the one I <laughs> the one I did like that was repeated a lot that. Uh, just added so much atmosphere to this was uh, the planes passed like a dream, oh, like ooh. over and over, like while oh yeah, love yeah. love that line. And I wonder if he had an inspiration because death came swirling down is from Homer, right? Is, yeah, is I right? believe it's from Homer. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if if maybe that is also an inspiration from something. Yeah. Um, the repetition that, of that one just yeah added such a yeah dreamlike like a yeah. fever dream like we were like a drug addled slog. <sighs> A curie <laughs> addled <laughs> fever dream. Oh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great book. Fantastic. Maybe my book of the year. Maybe, possibly, so far. I know the great order is going to be better, so it's pointless to even say it at this Jimmy, point. I've heard you say that about like a lot books. of people's favorite book. A lot of people like out of the Baker, the Bakerites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they love the great ordeal. And I do too. I have to admit, when I finished it, it took me. It's, I, it's one of those that is so dense and deep, and just like it really will is going to get your mind going. That it's not. It's in, almost impossible to like rate it right after you're done because you're just still ch like chewing on it. You're like, fuck, I I, I got to think about this for a while. <laughs> That's the shit. <laughs> yeah, Should it took me like about four, it took me about a week, <laughs> and I realized that it was my new favorite, and it just kept going like that. So damn. Well, That's here we go. Yeah. Here we go to the coffers. I'm so excited. A real chopper. Real of chopper. A book, a series, and a stream. Thank you guys again for coming on. I appreciate you. Chat, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. We are we are few, but we are passionate. And uh, I, I really enjoy the Baker fandom and everything it has to offer. So uh, hit like on the video. Helps people find it after the fact. And if you're the first time here, I'd love to have you subscribe. Make sure to go subscribe to Amanda and Mark's channels as well. They are fantastic content creators uh, that I try to emulate whenever I do my stuff. Uh, and I love having their perspective here. But until we see you for the great ordeal, be good, be safe. Remember to always keep turning the page.